Hello to another video about videos, cameras and making stuff happen in videos and photos maybe also. But today we are going to talk about camera basics and this is basically universal between video and photography. In video you have a bit more constraints but in general those same things still apply to the settings that you can manage on the camera. So first things first, in the beginning you are probably pretty happy with the results that you get with the auto mode, but with time you also get to know your camera better, maybe you make a course or maybe you read a lot about other pictures, or you just see other pictures and think, damn, I wanna do something like that, I wanna take a picture like that. But to actually be able to do those pictures that are higher quality and in more control, you have to do one thing, and that is more control on the picture. So you actually have to kind of control the variables that you are using in the camera. But there are just a couple of them and they are kind of easy to understand but then you actually have to test them, try them out and see what happens when you change those settings around. I will actually go over those settings in an overview in this video, explain how they work and what kind of effect they have on your image or the video. And then I also have a couple links in the description below. One of them is a camera simulator where you can try these settings out in at home basically. So you don't have to leave your home and you can just stay inside for example if you have shitty weather and you can try new camera settings but you actually have an environment that is more interesting and you have a subject to actually take photos of even though it is just digitally. It is really nice to understand how these work together especially if you want to try them together like changing the focal length, distance and aperture is actually something that is really interesting to test out. The other thing that is also linked in the description below is a cheat sheet that is really handy Maybe you print it out in the beginning and you can kind of return to it uh, because sometimes it is hard to understand uh, which settings are actually nicer with higher numbers and which settings are nicer with lower numbers and what they actually mean and do. But without further ado, let's start with the first setting that you can change and that is the shutter speed. So shutter speed. What is it? What does it? And which numbers should you aim for? In general, the shutter speed is the time that the picture actually gets light information. So if it, for example, is set to one-tenth of a second, the sensor actually sees light for one-tenth of a second, gives, gets that information, takes it from the analog world, turns it into the digital world, and that way you get a picture. Obviously the same thing applies to analog photography, but with the film and without the sensor. But we are talking about digital cameras, probably. So one tenth of a second is actually a long time, even though it may sound like a short moment. But in, tenth, in a tenth of a second, many things can happen. If you move your hand, for example, that is easily one tenth of a second. So you have a really blurry hand and you don't really want that. So if you want to have sharp images, you want to have that number bigger. So one tenth of a second is quite long. One one hundredth of a second is a really nice and sharp image, for example. The other thing you can consider in terms of shutter speed is also the focal length. So if you have a focal length for example of 25 millimeters that I'm filming on right now you can actually use maybe 1 50th of a second and still get a decently sharp image. Doing the same thing with a 85 or 100 millimeter lens would be much much harder to do if you don't want to use a tripod and also have moving subjects. And there's actually a kind of rule. So you have the focal length, which is in my case 25 millimeters here, and then you double that and come to 50, and then you have the 1 50th of a second, which should be the rule of thumb there. But you have to consider if the subject in front of the camera is actually the moving part in the picture, that rule is not really applicable that well, because this kind of rule only takes into account how much you shake as the photographer. So how much shake you bring to the picture is kind of offset with with this rule so 1 50th with 25 millimeters and for example 160 if you have 85 millimeters. Aiming for these kind of shutter speeds actually is a way to kind of get really nice and sharp images without you shaking too much and that is the one thing that you have to consider how much do you shake and then you would actually want to have a shorter shutter speed as if possible and shorter actually means higher number behind this one and then the slash. So you have one tenth, which is a rather long time, and then you have one one hundredth, which is rather short. The other thing that happens with the shutter speed is motion blur. So if you actually move the subjects while the shutter is open or the sensor is getting the light information, you have the blur effect. And if you actually want that, you want to go into the other direction. You actually want to have a longer shutter speed. So maybe even one, two or three seconds would be a nice shutter speed. But that gives you a new um, obstacle. If you actually want to do that in the day, for example, you have to 
reduce the light that the sensor sees with other aspects. And there are two other aspects that can give you more or less light, and that is the ISO and the aperture. Let's talk about the ISO first. In general, the ISO is the sensitivity of the sensor. So if you have a low number like 100, it is actually really insensitive and it is not really taking in a lot of light, but the quality it takes in is much higher. But if you go up in sensor sensitivity and in the ISO values, the sensitivity go goes up, so the picture will be brighter, but then also the noise will be more and more. So the biggest improvement in terms of ISO is mostly that cameras get better in using higher ISO numbers numbers with, uh, with less noise. So for example the Sony a7S and the Sony a7S Mark II, they handle noise really really well and they are pretty much night vision cameras, it's crazy. But for most other cameras if you're using something that is around 3000 in terms of ISO it really gets unusable or almost unusable for my opinion. So keeping the ISO low is something that really helps to improve the picture quality but you also should not have it too low and sometimes it is a good choice to kind of bump up the ISO to get sharper images and you can also use noise reduction in for example tools like Lightroom to kind of get rid of the bad parts of this kind of noise problem but again if you go too far the picture will just be noisy and that is not fun anymore. One thing that is also important in terms of noise and ISO is the size of the sensor and the uh, pixel count that the sensor has. For example, the Sony a7 is actually a full frame camera with 12 megapixels. The Sony a7 is a full frame camera with around 24 megapixels. So the sensor size is the same size in both cases, but the Sony a7 actually has much more room for each pixel and the Sony a7 Mark II, for example, has less room for each pixel, so the pixels need to be much, much smaller. And that is one of the reasons why the Sony a7 is actually such a good low-light camera, because it has bigger pixels instead of the Sony a7, for example, or even the Sony a7R Mark II, which is 45 megapixels or something, and the sensor is still the same size. So the sensor doesn't change in the three cameras, it's just the megapixel count, and bigger megapixels means less noise in higher ISOs, basically. From there we go to the aperture and the aperture is actually kind of the opening of the lens. So if the aperture is a really small number, for example 1.4 on my Sigma lens, it is really a wide opening. But if you have a smaller number, this kind of opening closes down further and further. And many lenses go up to six, an aperture of 16 or maybe even 20 or 22 and that is really really closed down. And there are two things the aperture changes in a picture. One thing is that it reduces the light as it closes down in terms of how much light goes to the sensor. On top of that, the aperture also dictates how much is in focus. But that is also dependent on the distance of the camera to the subject and it also depends on the focal length that, are you, that you are actually using. So the aperture kind of works together with three factors. You have the focal length, you have the distance to the subject and you have the aperture opening. A small kind of example in that regard is if you're using a 25mm and the subject is about 1.5 or maybe 2 meters away from the camera and you have to set the aperture to around 3.6, pretty much anything is in focus. But doing the same thing with the 85mm, the subject 2 meters away from the camera, the aperture at 3.6, you have a really shallow depth of field, which is a nice effect. Now going back to the 25mm, if we're actually able to focus on maybe 30 centimeters in front of the lens, and we just put the subject there, and then we still have the 3.6 in terms of aperture, then it is very possible that the background gets blurrier and blurrier. So the distance to the subject is actually important. As you move closer to the camera and keep the aperture at a small value, the background will get blurrier and blurrier. The other thing to keep in mind is if you want to have the background really nice and blurry to kind of distance the background from the subject. So if you have the background that is 100 meters away, it might be really nice and blurry. If you have a background like this here, you can see that the background is kind of blurry and the camera is set to an aperture of 2.8, but it is not super blurry. If however I would move away from this wall and do the same thing, sit at the same distance of the camera, the background would be much much blurrier. So these are kind of three different aspects of the aperture, focal length and distance gain. And this is actually the most interesting area where I would say it's good to check out the simulator for the camera settings and stuff that is linked in the description below because the working together of aperture, focal length and focal distance is something that is really really interesting. Getting to know these kind of settings and understanding how they work is something that I think is really crucial to kind of pushing your photography or videography to a new level.
However, I know that it is kind of a struggle for some people to get around all these numbers and remember if smaller is better or bigger is better or how to keep the balance and what you should change sometimes and what you shouldn't. And after you get to know all these settings and understand them better in manual mode, you may also be able to better decide for yourself which kind of half automatic way you would like to choose. Where I, for example, really enjoy my aperture priority mode, where I handle the aperture and say which kind of aperture I want and that kind of dictates how much is in focus and what is in focus. But then I let the camera handle the exposure for the most part in terms of shutter speed and ISO. That way I can work much faster because I don't have to worry about the other two settings all the time and I still can keep this kind of creative influence on my picture where I think the aperture and especially the kind of um, focal length aperture combination is something that I really want to control where I can see, um, also kind of change the amount of focus area. Overall, I hope this was kind of a clear explanation of these kind of modes, settings and how they affect the pictures. I would definitely recommend you to check out the simulator and also maybe the cheat sheet that I linked in the description below. If you have any questions about this stuff, please leave them in the comments below and also let me know what I could maybe change on these videos. Other than that, I would really appreciate it if you give this video a like and also subscribe to this channel for more videos like this. In the description, I also have the link to the playlist that I have about all this kind of video making stuff, so you can check that out. And I will see you in the next video. Until then, have an amazing day. Bye.